I'm Roger Woods, one of the shepherds and minister with the Walled Lake Church of Christ. Thank you for joining me today for this sermon and Lord's Supper devotional for Sunday, February the 21st, 2021. Well, winter has certainly had its grip on us as a nation lately, hasn't it? It's been cold from coast to coast and north to south. It's, uh, it's just been terrible. Those who are not used to dealing with these sub-zero temperatures like we are up here have had to deal with the snow, the ice, the power outages, and we just feel so, so bad for you. Um, and uh, on top of this, we're still dealing with the pandemic. <laughs> we can take it, right? Oh, Lord, please. This is not easy. But with God, we can endure it. Matter of fact, we can do more than endure it. We can be more than conquerors. Let's sing about this great God and how wonderful he is. Uh, this is uh, two songs out of Songs in, of Faith and Praise, uh, number 96 and 97, but I'll be singing them in the opposite order, number 97 and 96. I sing praises to your name and I stand in awe of you. I sing praises to your name, O Lord, praises to your name, O Lord, for your name is great and greatly to be praised. I sing praises to your name, O Lord, praises to your name. O Lord, for your name is great and greatly to be praised. I give glory to your name, O Lord, glory to your name, O Lord, for your name is great and greatly to be praised. I give glory to your name, O Lord, glory to your name, O Lord, for your name is great and greatly to be praised. You are beautiful for your description, too marvelous for words, too wonderful for comprehension, like nothing ever seen or heard. Who can grasp your infinite wisdom? Who can fathom the depth of your love? You are beautiful beyond description. Majesty enthroned above. And I stand, I stand in awe of you. I stand, I stand in awe of you. Mighty God, to whom all praise is due, I stand in awe of you. Our reading today is going to come out of the book of Genesis, and we'll be reading from the sixth chapter starting in verse 1 and going through verse 8. Why don't you take a moment and pull your Bibles out uh, and be ready to not only read this passage, but be ready to uh, back up a bit with me as I read uh, or as I survey quickly uh, the rest of chapters 4 and chapter 5, leading us up to our text for today. Hear the word of the Lord, Genesis 6 verses 1 through 8. When the men and men began to increase in number on the earth, and daughters were born to them, the sons of God saw that the daughters of men were beautiful, and they married any of them they chose. Then the Lord said, My spirit will not contend with man forever. 
for he is mortal. His days will be a hundred and twenty years. The Nephtalim were on the earth in those days, and also afterward, when the sons of God went to the daughters of men and had children by them. They were the heroes of old, men of renown. The Lord saw how great man's wickedness on the earth had become, and that every inclination of the thoughts of his heart were only evil all the time. The Lord was grieved that he had made man on the earth, and his heart was filled with pain. So the Lord said, I will wipe mankind, whom I have created from the face of the earth, men and animals and creatures that move along the ground, and birds of the air, for I am grieved that I have made them. But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. How did we get to this point? How did it all go so wrong? So wrong that God regretted what he had called good and saw the need to do a reboot. I'm talking about the world in Noah's day, not ours. Well, there may be some lessons for us, too. I'm not going to linger on the rest of chapter 4. As I said, I'm going to do a quick survey through chapter 6. But it is important that we do this survey so that we can appreciate why God was ready to reboot his entire creation on earth. So get your Bibles open, be ready as we move through this. There are many assumptions that we have brought to this text that need to be re-examined, and I hope to do that today, or at least introduce that today. As we sum up these passages, I want you to know how I'm approaching this. As I said last week, I am not attempting to untangle the confusing situation we have caused due to our failing to understand the genre, the purpose, and the intended meaning of Genesis. So I will not even step into the question of why people are reported to have lived the long years that they are reported to in these genealogies. There are many theories. Some are biologically based. Others are on, based on literary devices. But for the purposes of understanding how it impacted the original readers, we don't really need to untangle that. The text is pretty clear. Indeed, I think we have gotten so tangled up in the trees that we've lost track of the trail, and frankly, we've gotten lost. So let's step back from those minute details and look instead at the flow of the story. This, I believe, will reveal the main message God inspired Moses to pass on to the nation of Israel as they, during the Exodus, were formed into a nation, into a people of God, a people for God. And it is this message that remains important for us to understand today. In chapter 4, verses 17 through 24, we have a quick genealogy for Cain. Then, starting in 425, we begin the genealogy for the line of Seth, who was born to Adam and Eve after the death of Abel. Cain's line culminates, if you will, with Lamech. Note the boast of Lamech in verses 23 through 24. Lamech said to his wives, Ada and Zillah, Listen to me, wives of Lamech. Hear my words. I have killed a man for wounding me, a young man for injuring me. If Cain is avenged seven times, then Lamech seventy-seven times. The legacy of Cain's nature is passed on and intensified. Now, five generations from Cain, we find his descendant boasting about the men he has killed and twisting the promise of God to protect Cain to become a license for him to kill. Now, this is contrasted with the lineage of Seth. Seth's firstborn son is Enosh, and it is at the beginning of this line that the contrast is made very clear. Cain's descendant becomes worse than his ancestor. Seth's son is the beginning of a time when people began to call on the name of the Lord. Now, the Hebrew term here that is translated call on can also mean proclaim. 
Chapter 5 starts with an important formula in Genesis. I'm going to just note this. Uh, this is written, or this is the written account, of Adam's line, his family line. This formula has already been seen in chapter 2, verse 4, and it will be seen 10 more times in Genesis. Each time it denotes an important point in the history of the world in relationship to Israel. Keep your eye out uh, for this and for how it functions in the context of the narrative of Genesis. For our purposes today, I think it's interesting to note one of the folks in this list, Enoch. Chapter 5, verse 22. There we read, After he became the father of Methuselah, Enoch walked faithfully, faithfully with God 300 years and had other sons and daughters. Altogether, Enoch lived a total of 365 years. Enoch walked faithfully with God, and then he was no more, because God took him away. There is no one in Cain's line who is so distinguished. You know, further, Enoch is noted in the New Testament, in Hebrews 11's roll call of the faithful. There we read in verse 5 that by faith, Enoch was taken from this life so that he did not experience death. He could not be found because God had taken him away. For before he was taken, he was commended as one who pleased God. Cain and his descendants are remembered as murderers. Seth, through his son Enosh, and his descendants are remembered as faithful to God. And this includes one descendant whom we will be looking at for the next five weeks, Noah. So the contrast between Cain and Seth is clear. One is a murderer, the other calls upon the name of the Lord. And because of this blessing through Seth's line to Noah, Noah was found faithful and ready to do God's will. So as we begin chapter 6, we, begin, we encounter a difficulty that we have when translating from one language to another, especially when one language is a dead language, no longer spoken. Modern Hebrew is a resurrected language that has no direct living link to biblical Hebrew. Many believe that even by the time of Christ, Hebrew was primarily a scholarly language or only used in the synagogue for the reading of scripture. And even then, uh, we have found in the ruins of ancient synagogues translations of the scripture because they didn't read Hebrew. Aramaic was the dominant local language in Israel, certainly by the time of the return from exile by the Israelites, by, the, by those from Judah, if not even before. So we have this question here about the sons of God and the daughters of humans. You know, much has been made over time about these sons being angels. There's some real problems with this interpretation. And I won't belabor this too much now, but I will say that within the context of Genesis, it just doesn't make sense. It makes the most sense that these sons of God are the descendants of Enosh and that they began to marry the daughters of those who did not call on the name of the Lord. This explains how the world became more and more sinful. We see the same process happening to Israel during the Exodus as they married Midianite women who led them away from God. I might add that this is another reason that you should marry a partner who shares or at least supports your religious views. Both here and in Exodus, the mixed religious marriages led to the downfall of the people of God. Verse 3 is related to the time that God is setting before the flood, not putting a limit on the years that people will live, which is clearly not the case since they indeed lived longer than that after the flood. Check out the genealogies in chapter 11. By the way, this is most likely where the idea that Noah preached to the people 120 years before the flood, something that is not mentioned in this text or the Bible. Only in extra-biblical Jewish and Christian commentary do we find this teaching. 
And by the way, the Nephilim, I don't think they were giants. They were, in the context of this passage, the heroes, the heroes of old, the men of renown. I told you I was going to re-examine and challenge some of these assumptions that we brought to the text. And it's important that we do, brothers and sisters. If we want the Bible to be believed, then we must put forward a believable interpretation. There is no reason to make up giants when the text explains itself quite clearly. The gist of this is that due to the weakness of the sons of God, sin is once again dominating mankind. Indeed, so much so that God regrets his creating man at all and considers rebooting the whole thing. No more than a reboot. It, 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 it's more than a reboot. It is a complete and utter wipe, to use the lingo from computers. In verse 5, God looks on humanity and determines that every inclination of the thoughts of the human heart was only evil all the time. Now, folks, I want to make a brief comment. We live in better times than that. I know, I know. The popular narrative fed many of us. And by the way, when somebody is telling you something, always determine what their agenda is before you jump on board. You know, many use sensationalized statistics to scare us straight or to rally us to a righteous cause. This is true of the left. This is true of the right. This is true of the commercial. This is true of the nonprofit. This is true of the secular. This is true of the religious. And it's called manipulation. Brothers and sisters, we are not called to manipulate people for Christ. We are called to persuade, to implore them to follow Christ. If we lift up the beauty of Christ. Well, the comparison will be undeniable. A couple of examples should help us see the manipulation that is constantly trying to restrict the children of God. You know, it is popular in the U.S. to talk about the decline of Christianity from the left and from the right. The left, well, they want to try to free society from the bondage of religion, and the right, of course, wants to try to take back our rightful place in our culture. Folks, in my opinion, the culture wars that we have fought in this nation for the last 30 years have not done a lot for the cause of Christ. What would happen if we stopped fighting for and just started being Christ in this world? The fact of the matter is that the percentage of the world who is Christian, is growing. But we fail to see this because of the doomsday prophets in our own culture and because we are so focused here. In the global south and far east, Christianity is experiencing exponential growth. We just don't see it because we're so wrapped up in ourselves. We need to take the advice of the psalmist in Psalm 121 and lift up our eyes so that we can see the one who will help, the Lord who is the maker of heaven and earth. Our faith is too small, church. It is too small. Another example of this is marriage. You know, the popular mantra uh, over, is that over 50% of marriages end in divorce. This we hear from the secular world. This we hear from the religious world. What's the facts? In a 2017 article in Insider, of all places, this is debunked. In fact, 65% of marriages from the 1970s and 1980s reached 15 years without divorcing. That's a divorce rate of only 35%. Marriages in the 1990s divorced at a rate of only 30%. And those married in the 2000s only have a divorce rate of 15% at 15 years. So let's be sure that we get our facts straight 
before we pass anything on, whether it's from the pulpit, I'm guilty of that, in our social media feeds. Folks, truth trumps any other agenda. Let me repeat that. Truth trumps any other agenda. Do I hear an amen? It is better to trust God and keep our integrity than to subvert truth and lose all credibility and bring shame on our Lord. But God in Genesis 6 does not find a world like ours today. He finds a world where every inclination of the thoughts of the human heart was only evil all the time. Now, are, those there, are, are there those today that fit this description? Well, yes, of course. But there are many, a great many, who do not fit that description. Take heart about that and praise God. Praise him that Noah was found faithful by God. God was ready to wipe it all out. But because of Noah, we're here. All of the creation, from the perspective of the first recipients of Genesis, was corrupted beyond redemption. But they and we learn something about God, about his loving, devoted character, and his willingness to try it once again. And Noah is his chosen reset. He chooses one who calls on the name of the Lord. Now we will explore Noah and the narrative about the flood in depth over the next several weeks. Noah casts a large shadow over the biblical story. And his story gives us clues on how to live faithfully before God, even in the midst of a lost and deprived generation. His story shows us that God can do extraordinary things through those who will trust him. And you don't have to be extraordinary. God has that covered. Okay? You just need to be faithful. And faith doesn't mean perfect or without fault. As we learn, Noah, whew, Noah's not perfect. But he was willing willing to buck the trends of culture, willing to lead his family to know the Lord, willing to labor to accomplish God's will, no matter how crazy that seemed from the world's point of view. Noah is the first example of remnant theology in the Bible. We'll see this idea developed more fully in Judges and in the kingdom period of Israel. All seem to abandon God, but a few remain faithful, and it is this few that God uses. Not all have bowed the knee to Baal, as God tells Elijah. Oh, we need to hear that, too. Don't we need to hear that? Even at the low point of ancient Jewish history, when they were taken into exile as punishment, God preserved a remnant who would return to rebuild Jerusalem and the temple. Church, we need to keep our eyes on the prize, on Jesus Christ. Don't look. Don't look at the stormy waves all around us. Don't look at the chaos of our society. That is a sure way to sink. Peter found that out the hard way, didn't he? And that is just where the evil one wants us to look. Look at the chaos. Look at the despair until we are beyond reasoning in our minds. That is why Jesus warned and comforted his disciples that in the world you will have tribulation. But take heart, I have overcome the world. Now that doesn't mean we stay above it all, out of the fray. No, it means that we keep our eye on Christ as we represent him in the midst of it all. The turmoil is real. Yes, it is, and it's in us. But he who is in us is greater than he who is in the world. We need to remember that. He has all power in heaven and on earth and under the earth. He is Lord of the living and the dead. He is the firstborn from the dead and sits enthroned at the right hand of God. 
He is the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning and the end of all things. He is your deliverer and shield, your fortress in your time of need. He is your solid rock upon which you have built your spiritual house and it shall not be moved. He is the Lion of Judah, who is the mighty in power and strong to deliver you. He is our brother, redeemer, savior, and friend. Don't despair about the state of our world. Instead, trust Christ. Be faithful. Lift him up so that the world knows that the king is in residence here, in our lives, in the church, even if we are but a remnant. And thankfully, we are not. God knows how to work with remnants and from them create a whole that is beautiful beyond description, that is too marvelous for words, that is too wonderful comp for comprehension. It is like nothing that has ever been seen. Or heard. That is the kingdom of heaven. And you can be a part of this kingdom, this kingdom that God is building in our world today. It begins with trusting faith, the kind that Noah had. <laughs> trusting to build an ark in the middle of nowhere because God said so. A faith that shows its authenticity by its willingness to obey. Indeed, this is love, to obey God's will. A faith that is centered in Jesus Christ, God's only Son and our Savior. A faith that is willing to die to self and live for Christ. That faith and God's grace meet at the cross. They meet at the place where we die to self. In our watery grave of baptism from which we arise, free from the power of sin, free to live for Christ, free to enjoy the blessings of being in his family. If, Christian, you have given in to despair and lost your way, you can always come back to the light of his way. Confess your sin and be forgiven. Don't wait for another day to reach out, for there will be a day when it is too late. We can assist you in any way in your walk with Christ, whether to come to Christ and put him on as your savior in baptism or to return to Christ, to be reinstated, to be renewed and restored to your place in the kingdom, to your role, to your vital role, sharing the good news of Jesus Christ. Please don't hesitate to contact me. The Lord is always ready. His invitation is never closed, at least in this life. Let's sing about this God that we can trust, that we can call out to, even in the midst of the trials and tribulation and storms of life. We'll be singing hymn number 189 in Songs of Faith and Praise. Master, the tempest is raging. <clears throat> Master, the tempest is raging, the billows are tossing high. The sky is o'ershadowed with blackness, no shelter nor help is nigh. Carest thou not that we perish? How canst thou lie asleep? When each moment is madly is threatening a grave in the angry deep, the winds and the waves shall obey thy will. Peace be still. Whether the wrath of the storm toss sea, or demons, or men, or whatever it be, no water can swallow the ship where lies the master of ocean and earth and sky. They all shall sweetly obey thy will. Peace be still, peace be still. They all shall sweetly obey thy will. Peace, peace, be still. Master, with anguish of spirit, I bow in my grief today. The depths of my sad heart are troubled. Awaken and save, I pray. Torrents of sin and of anguish sweep o'er my sinking soul. And I perish, I perish, dear master, O oh, hasten and take control. The winds and the waves shall obey thy will. Peace, 
be still. Whether the wrath of the storm tossed sea, or demons, or men, or whatever it be, no water can swallow the ship where lies the master of ocean and earth and sky. They all shall sweetly obey thy will. Peace be still, peace be still. They all shall sweetly obey thy will. Peace, peace, be still. Master, the terror is over. The elements sweetly rest. Earth's sun in the calm lake is mirrored, and heaven's within my breast. Linger, O oh blessed Redeemer, leave me alone no more, and with joy I shall make the blessed harbor, and rest on the blissful shore. The winds and the waves shall obey thy will, Peace be still. Whether the wrath of the storm tossed sea, or demons, or men, or whatever it be, no water can swallow the ship where lies the master of ocean and earth and sky. They all shall sweetly obey thy will. Peace be still. Peace be still, they all shall sweetly obey thy will. Peace, peace, be still. What a blessing we have in Christ. As we prepare to partake of the Lord's Supper, I'd like to read from Hebrews, the 19th chapter, excuse me, the 10th chapter, verses 19 through 25. This is not a passage we normally go to during the Lord's Supper, but it certainly is appropriate, and it reminds us of just how precious a blessing we have in Jesus Christ and in this opportunity weekly to remember his death, burial, and resurrection, to remember the hope and salvation that we have in him. Let us listen to God's word. Therefore, Brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way opened for us through the curtain, that is, his body, and since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with the full assurance that faith brings, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold unswaveringly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how we may spur one another on to love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. When we come before the Lord at his table, we are coming to celebrate. Notice the writer said that we have full assurance. When we come to the Lord with a sincere heart and accept his salvation, when we were plunged beneath the waters of baptism and risen again, we are given such a confidence, so many precious promises, as we are cleansed of our guilt and made pure before God. We need to hold on to that, folks. Yeah, the storms of the world are all over the place, aren't they? But we have a hope. We have a hope that is anchored in the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. We know that what we have committed to him is secure until that day when we are called home called before his judgment seat, called to hear the words, I pray. Well done, good and faithful servant. By grace, we have this hope. Would you bow in prayer with me? Holy God, we thank you for this bread that represents the body of your son, Jesus, who on the night he was betrayed, broke it and said, take, eat of this.
this. This is my body given for you. Lord, what a gift. We feel so unworthy. But Lord, you have told us that we are worthy. You have told us that we are loved. And you have shown us that through your son, Jesus Christ, willingness to die, willingness to take on human form, to become human, and to suffer and die in our place so that we can have hope, so that we can have that living way through the curtain, directly into your presence. We thank you for this, Lord. We thank you for his love. And we thank you for this bread, which helps us remember and helps us rejoice in the hope that we have through him. In his name I pray. Amen. And now let's bow for the cup. Holy God, as we partake of this fruit of the vine, which is a symbol of your son's blood shed for us on the cross, given as a, as a drink offering, given to wash away our sins, the sins of all your faithful through all time. Father, we are, we are humbled at this precious gift. We are humbled at the new relationship that it makes possible for us, this new covenant in which we no longer need to go through intermediaries but we can go directly to you through God the Son, Jesus Christ. Father, thank you for this. Thank you for the hope and joy that we have knowing that our sins are made, are, are washed away and that we have access to the blood of Christ as long as we are seeking to walk in his light, even as he is in the light. Father, thank you for that promise and thank you for this reminder again of what he was willing to do for us on the cross. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen. Let's partake. <clears throat> Thank you for joining me again. And I pray that uh, this week for you down south will be warmer. Uh, and for the rest of us will be a week that is blessed with opportunities to hold up our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, to see the good that is out there, to see the harvest that is out there, that God has prepared for us to do. Let us have hope, the hope of Christ, and not despair. Have a blessed week. <clears throat>